back to undulations. You might know the company Arturia as a maker of software synthesizers and plugins, maybe something like pigments. You might also know them as a company that makes the Keystep or the Beatstep Pro, some really solid MIDI controllers. I like them for making the Microbrute, which is a nice analog synthesizer. And if you mix all of these things together, it's no surprise that Arturia would make the Microfreak, which is a hybrid digital and analog synthesizer with an interesting control scheme. Now, the Microfreak is compact, and because it's digital, it can be quite portable and run off of a USB power pack. It's got good connectivity in the form of CV out, similar to the controllers that I mentioned. It's got MIDI in and MIDI out. It's got USB connectivity to the computer so that you can manage presets, update. It's a monaural synthesizer, so there's no panning or that sort of thing. And if I had to describe the Microfreak in one sentence, I'd say, well, it's a four voice paraphonic semi-modular synthesizer that is mostly digital with an analog filter and an analog VCA that runs when it's in monophonic mode. Now, what does all that mean? First off, the paraphonic part. It's not full on polyphonic, nor is it limited to being monophonic. Basically, you have four voices that are coming all the way, almost out the door, and then right at the very end, with the filter, that is only a single thing. And so it's not quite four voices. Now, there's some other things about the VCAs where the, if you're in paraphonic mode, you use a digital VCA on each voice, but in monophonic mode, it's a analog VCA. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But the main point is that there's a lot that you can do with it. The digital oscillator is in my opinion, very flexible. Lots of interesting synthesis methods. If you are into instruments, maybe world music or that sort of thing, or stuff that is just really different, I think this is a cool synthesizer for you to think about. The modulation matrix method is very powerful. In some ways it's like patch cables, but in other ways it's better because you can make them either positive or negative connections. So that's a lot like attenuators in modular synthesis. And so it's certainly too much to cover in one video. Today, what I want to talk about is the digital oscillator and the different synthesis methods. So those are some modulation destinations. We need some sources. I think the best way to start is by just keys and the envelope, and then also the keyboard pressure as a modulation source. So we're going to use the matrix to try and see how we can hook these things up and get some interesting sounds. And then next video, we'll cover LFOs and the cycling envelope. And then probably the video after that, go into things more about performance sequences and that sort of thing. So let's dive in. So before I forget, I want to point out that the Microfreak manual is quite nice. Lots of information and lots of interesting tips as well. I'm using the DC power in with the power brick that shipped with it. I'm going to turn it on. I recommend not using your headphones while you turn it on. It's a little pop. And note that I'm using the headphone out jack to record the audio. If you use the quarter inch line out, you need to be careful that you're using a balanced destination for that line out. Uh, you could do it with a set of headphones. This is my headphone plug. I could plug it in back there. It would not sound right. The balanced signal, it's got some phase flipping done. So avoid that unless you're sending it to something like an audio interface or a uh, set of monitors with balanced input. So let's just sort of tour around. We've got master volume up here. The utility button lets you dive into some menus that can control some settings. Here's how you save presets that you make. This is the preset scrolling knob. There are 128 factory presets. 
and you can scroll through those quite quickly. One thing to notice, let me try to magnify it here, is that each preset has sort of a category that goes with it, and that can be quite handy for knowing what you're dealing with. And then once you get up past 128, there are 32 so-called template presets. And these are just things that sort of like get you started in a particular direction. And then once you get up past 160, that's where the user presets are. And I've done a few and everything on mine from 167 up to 256 is just an init preset, which is a bass and it sounds like this. You can unlock the factory presets and overwrite them if you want to have more down in that range. One common problem with digital synths is the parameter settings for a given preset versus the actual knobs on the panel. And Arturia gives a bunch of different ways to deal with that. Most of the time it's not really going to matter. You just sort of wiggle a knob and it will become kind of lined up. That's great. But they also have a panel button up here that allows you to basically push that and then the preset matches the knobs. So it's sort of the opposite way that you normally deal with that. Here's the paraphonic button, and we'll be turning that on and off to check out how the different sounds go with that. This is the encoder that is used to control the modulation matrix, so some of these encoders actually click. And then these are the envelope parameters down here. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll talk some about the filter amount in a little bit. The amp mod is just a way to basically turn off the effect that the envelope has on a note's volume. So right now if it's like this, and if I turn that off, so then it's just controlled by the gate of the keys. I'm going to turn that back on. Here's the filter. You can hear what that sounds like. Turn the resonance up if you want. I'm always going to try to leave the cutoff all the way up and the resonance all the way down so that we can get a good representation of the sounds and then if we want to use the filter we can. So in this video I'm not going to talk at all about some of the arpeggio parameters. Uh, there is a nice hold button over here. But the main thing to draw your attention to is this strip up here. This is by default a bending strip. Now, I want to talk about the modulation matrix in just a second, but it's really easiest to show sort of the general concept of modulation using this filter amount knob. And I'll tell you what I mean by that, which is that if we have an envelope, I'm going to put some attack on that. And now I'm going to turn the filter amount up. So what that's going to do is let the envelope control the cutoff frequency. And I'm going to turn the cutoff frequency down. And then when I hit a note, you can hear the filter and I'm going to increase the resonance to make it even more noticeable. Turn out the decay some. Okay, so that's sort of one classic way to use a modulation. It's where the modulation is positive, and in this case, going with the envelope. And if you do that, you want to start with whatever parameter you're modulating, in this case, the cutoff, low, so that it goes up and sweeps through. Now, another method is to have a negative modulation and then start with the parameter high. So and that would sound like this. And as you can tell, they're completely different. Now, before we get into the main event of the digital oscillator, I want to talk briefly just about the pressure sensitivity of the keyboard and the modulation matrix in general. You may have noticed already seen a bit of the modulation matrix when I turn this knob you'll notice that the light comes on over here 
that is a light that links the envelope and the cutoff. Now I'm going to set it back to zero and it makes that light go off. But the mod matrix has got, uh, let me try to magnify this. Uh, the mod matrix has got down the left hand side the cycling envelope, the regular envelope, the LFO, the pressure from the keyboard, and then the keys slash arpeggiator. And those are the sources of modulation. And then across the top, you've got uh, seven things, the pitch, the wave, which is a oscillator parameter, the timbre, which is also an oscillator parameter, and then the cutoff. And then it's a little more complicated with these last three. These are assignable destinations. So assign one, assign two, assign three. These are actually little buttons up here. These are just lights out on the field. These three things are buttons that you use to set those destinations. Now, one thing in the manual, they talk about having 35 patch points. These are not what I would consider patch points. This is like 35 patch cables that you can sort of make them conduct or not, and positively or negatively. There are five sources, seven destinations, three of the destinations you can choose. It can basically be almost any parameter. You can't change your preset. That would be funny if you could, but that can't be done. Can't change the master volume. I think that's more of an audio safety thing. I think everything else is pretty much fair game, but the interesting thing is that you can also modulate a modulation. So that would be like maybe you wanted the envelope to change an LFO depth. You can do that on this thing. So it's very sophisticated in that sense. So as an example, what I want to do is set up a relationship between the pressure and the pitch. So to do that, I just run the encoder to there and then I click it. Now that's going to let me change that. And I'm going to run it up to say 50. Now these are percentages. So the modulation amounts are always pretty easy to keep track of. There's no absolute numbers to keep track of. It's all relative. And so I'm going to run that up to close to 50 and set it. What that's done is connected the pressure on a key to the pitch. And as you can hear, it's quite sensitive. These keys, they're sort of the most controversial thing about the Microfreak, I'd say, but they have basically no action at all. There are some ridges that keep them from just being sort of a a continuous sheet. I think it has a nice feel to it, but it's like anything else uh, just takes a while to get used to. And note, this is a capacitive sensor, not a conduction sensor. So I can, for example, take a post-it note and still play a note, but I can't change the note. So I'm able to trigger it, but not able to take it any further. I recommend if you're going to try and bend stuff through pressure, trim your nails so that you can get a nice limited contact and then flatten out to control the pressure modulation. Now, do you think that you could perhaps play a song on one key? I tried that. I tried to play Happy Birthday, and I'm going to put on Instagram what I'm calling the Microfreak Happy Birthday Challenge. And it's just trying to play the song Happy Birthday on one key on the Microfreak, set everything else up however you like, and uh, take a look at my version of it.
So now we're getting to where we really want to be, which is looking at the digital oscillator. This is sort of the heart and soul of the microfreak. Now, the type knob, that controls what type of synthesis that you're going to be using. And you can cycle through 12 different types of synthesis. And so we're going to be looking at those one at a time. The init preset is using the basic waves type. Then the wave, timbre, and shape knobs, those are somewhat of a generic uh, label on purpose so that they have different meaning depending on the type of synthesis that you're using. Now, I kind of find the wave one to be quite important, and then the timbre and the shape are a little more for uh, modifying. And so what I want to do is Let's liven these things up by connecting the envelope to the timbre and the pressure to the shape. And so I'm just going to set that up in the mod matrix. First thing to do is to press and hold to get rid of the connection between pressure and the pitch. And so the first thing I'm going to do is back this thing up and go to where the envelope connects to the timbre. And I'm going to make that positive. I'll go with 50% again. And uh, then we're going to make sure that the um, and lock that in. And then we're going to make sure that the timbre setting is down. So right now it is. And then for the next thing, we'll get to use this assignment feature. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to move the encoder to pressure and assign one. Then I'm going to hold the assign one button down and change the shape knob. So that's made an assignment. And then we're going to push the button and I'm going to make that positive 50. And we're going to turn that down. So I've connected envelope to timbre and pressure to shape. And then we're going to control wave by hand as we go through the 12 different types. Oh, I almost forgot. We should probably save this. So I'm going to click save and then it's saying save preset 167 into 167. I'm going to click it and I don't want it to be a base. We'll just, we'll have it as a, maybe a template How about that. And then I'm going to click to save it and, um, then you just scroll through some letters. I'll call it test. And then you hit save again and it's done. So one more thing to say before we really get into the oscillator. I had some issues where the, I was like doing an encoder, pushing the button and then doing the preset encoder. And every time I did that, it would undo what I had done because when you turn the knob, it literally like right now, what we just did, if we hadn't saved it, it would have been gone. So there's an instrument that I did the other day and here now. And, but we can go back to test. And so that's what we set up. Now there's a setting in the utility that you can change and then the system will ask you if you really want to load up another preset. I didn't make that change because I figure it's probably easier to just get used to not touching the knob unless I really mean it. Okay, so first synthesis method is called basic waves and the parameters are morph which I'm going to set all the way down to zero. And then this is the symmetry. And then this is the sub. So there's a low frequency component. Right now they're all zeroed. And uh, what I can do is when I hit the hit a note, you'll hear the timbre sweep through the envelope. the octave and then I can change the wave so that we can listen to what the morph does 
Let me turn the amp mod off for a second. The morph is moving us from a square wave to a sawtooth to two sawtooths, a little bit razzier. Then I can turn the envelope back on and you can hear how that sounds with the timbre change. Sort of a metallicity to it. Now I'm going to try and do the pressure. You can hear that sub come in. But it's deep. You have to have headphones for that. I'll come up here. Okay, so I think we get that, that that's kind of a basic synthesis thing that you can uh, set up to get some nice sounds with. Now, this is also a reasonable time to talk about the paraphonic setting. Right now, I've got it uh, at monophonic, so it's sort of a lead type sound. They're mutually exclusive, and so there's no chord in the ring down there. and. Let me uh, hit paraphonic and you'll hear the difference. And it's worth pointing out that while I tend to think of something like paraphonic as being relevant to chords, it's as relevant to things like arpeggios and melody lines because you get that, uh, especially when you're release time is fairly long, you get that sort of chording as you go. So it's quite pretty. And this is also a great time to point out that the pressure, for example, is yet another one of the paraphonic things where the, you can hold the notes, but the pressure can be different for each one. get a chord or fifth there in the sub. Okay, next synthesis method is the super wave. I've zeroed the three parameters and the first one, it just changes what the waveform is, saw, square, triangle, or sine. And then the uh, timbre is actually doing a detune and then uh, this shape controls the volume of the detuned waves. So uh, let's just try some of that out. So that's just from the envelope detune. I'm gonna start it a little higher. Envelope takes it way up. Maybe a little lower. All right, I'll try some pressure to get the relative volumes. And I'll try some of the other waves, shapes. Triangle's really mellow. It might be nice to hit that square wave with the filter a little bit, kind of resonance up some. Superwave seems nice and pretty straightforward. So then the next synthesis method is wavetable synthesis. And this first knob lets you choose which table you're in. And then the timbre changes the position where you are in that. So that may not work out that good for how we've been doing it. So I may turn the envelope off. 
and then the shape is actually just a chorus so the pressure will control the chorus so let's take a listen to that I'm gonna go back to monophonic <laughs> Pressure for chorus. So I've gone down an octave and have the amplitude back on. It's kind of cool. That's a pretty wide variety of sounds in the wave table. Okay, now we're going to move on to the next one, which is the harmonic oscillator. I won't spend a lot of time on the harmonic oscillator synthesis method, but it's basically adding harmonics, and uh, with the timbre, you're changing what types of harmonics are added, whether it's from a square wave or a sine wave, and there are some different tables of harmonics that you change with the wave. And then again, the shape is a chorus. So I'm just going to play it for a second and we'll see what it sounds like. Okay, so now we're headed up into some of my favorite types of synthesis. This next one is the Carpleux Strong synthesis. This is a physical modeling synthesis of things like drums and particularly string instruments. And so what you've got is a strike that is sort of the excitation of the sound. And then with the wave knob, you can add in some bowing to the strike and then the timbre changes the position where the strike takes place on the string if you've messed with a string instrument like a guitar at all you know that where you pluck makes a difference of the timbre and then the shape has to do with the decay of the sound so i'm going to probably not try to modulate those things that much at first just so we can get an idea so i'm going to turn the amp mod off to start with and so let's just hear how some of these things sound i'm going to make sure that these things are down so even though i've got the decay release up because the decay is set low it's just got a plucky sound so if i do this i'm using pressure to set that decay now i'm going to just go ahead and turn that up And you can, I think, control that by the envelope, though. Yeah. So it's sort of a mix of those two. 
Now I'm going to add in some bowing. That's really nice. And I'll uh, change this uh, strike position. Take that down an octave. You might notice I'm just sticking to the black keys so that we have just some pentatonic sounds to work with. I'm not really trying to play any songs or such with it at this point. Let's change the filter amount. And it's very easy to uncouple the uh, envelope from the timbre. I'll just do that for a second. Zero it out and... So we've done five synthesis methods so far, and we're at an important break point because those are the Arturia synthesis schemes, and the next seven are going to be from mutable instruments. They make gear for modular synthesis, and their PLATS module, which is a digital oscillator module, is open source, and so Arturia, with their permission, used the mutable instruments algorithms to do the rest of these synthesis methods that we cover. So the first mutable instruments synthesis method is virtual analog, and you'll see right away that things are set up a little bit different where the, the first parameter is the detune parameter, the second parameter is a shape, so this changes some uh, pulse widths and Yeah, so it, it can be a little bit confusing that the wave is now a detune and the timbre is now a shape, not the shape, this shape, but that shape. And then this is a wave, not that wave. Anyway, doesn't matter. We're just going to listen to it. And this is what it sounds like. It's got a really deep sub so you can hear the detune there I'm just going to turn that all the way back off and we'll check out some of these other things I'll turn amp mod off and we'll scroll through that Okay, so that gives an idea. And then we can do the pressure. That's real nice. I don't think the filter was all the way open, so let's listen to that again.
it's worth probably having some headphones for. It's got a really nice uh, crispness to it. I'm gonna turn the paraphonic off. We'll hear the difference. It's certainly beefier. I think they kind of like spread the volume out in the paraphonic so that you don't overwhelm your system. So it's like if you maybe if you did a, a four note chord that the volume's the same as a single note in paraphonic. To me, that's just really beautiful. And the next one from Mutable is the Wave Shaper Synthesis. And this is some kind of classic folding type of uh, stuff. And, uh, and there are some classic parameters on this. There is the wave folding amount. And then there's an asymmetry to the wave. And so we'll just... Uh, check those out. I'm going to turn this off for a second and we can just hear it as it is. So this is just changing the waveform. Then this is adding in the folding. Alright, I'm going to, I feel like we need a little bit of filter on that. I'm going to turn the filter down and the amount up and we'll put the amp mod back on. I like being able to do that asymmetry with the pressure. Okay. Camera just shut off. Battery. Okay, battery on the camera just died, but I was getting ready to say that I really like the way that the pressure changes the asymmetry on this wave shaper synthesis method. So let's take a listen. Turn the cutoff uh, resonance down. Like it deep on that. It's a really good sound to me. Some subtle stuff with the pressure, but I really like it. Okay, so the next one's pretty straightforward. It is a two operator FM synthesis. And uh, in this case, the wave parameter sets the ratio. So that's just basically the frequency ratio of the two operators. Then the timbre is gonna set the amount of modulation that you have. And then shape is the feedback. So. Again, I'm going to turn off the amp mod at first just so we get a clearer idea. And I'm going to not do any pressure at first. Let me come up and pitch. Okay, so that's a pretty plain tone there. It's real nice, but what I'm going to do is change the ratio. So this is going to start to sound a little bit like a castle if you're familiar with that synth. And I'm curious to turn on the amplitude of the envelope. That's some classic FM sounds. Make something punchy. That one's got some nice atmospheric sounds. All right, I like the two op FM a lot. Okay, so this next one is a sort of combination of formant synthesis and granular synthesis. It's referred to as a granular formant oscillator. Parameters are interval and Formant, and I'm going to turn them all the way down, and the shape. 
I'm going to turn that down too. And so these are some detailed things about formant synthesis and granular synthesis that I'm just not going to go into. We'll just listen to them. And so I'm going to turn the envelope off and that way we can kind of step through it. Now, I'm not hearing a lot there. Maybe you need to have this one up. Yeah. And can change the shape. As typical of formant synthesis, it's got sort of a voice-like quality to it. Go to paraphonic, you can hear some chords. And I'll put that amplitude modulation on. Okay, so that one's got a pretty big parameter space to explore, but it's just got that nice uh, formant voicey quality to it. And I guess the granular synthesis gives sort of a special spin to that. Now, the next synthesis scheme is called chords. And basically what it is, is um, it allows you even in monophonic mode to play chords from a single key. And I'll just hit something. So that's an octave there, and you can keep going up the fifth. So there's the sus4 and minor, minor seven. So there are some nice sounds that you can get out of this. There's also a control on the waveform over here. So it's chords and being able to change the synthesis a little bit. And then, I hadn't really talked about the timbre. That is the, uh, that takes control of the inversions of it. And so let's try it without the envelope. changes the waveform big time. Let me back off on that. Now I'm going to um, turn this back on and uh, boost that a little. And I'll get some attack time so you can hear it. Oh, and by the way, the manual says you can't do paraphony in the chord synthesis mode, but that turns out not to be true because it's pretty clear that you can. Okay, and we're getting near the end. The next to last one is the speech synthesis, and uh, that... I don't know whether to think of it as a little bit gimmicky or that you might could use it as a element in 
a track or maybe that the sounds that this method uses could actually be turned into a true synth voice, a usable synth voice. But to start with, you just hit some keys. And these are formants to start with. So again, voicey parameters. I'm going to turn the wave, turn the envelope off. So think of this as elements of a spoken word. And then you start getting to the actual words. And the timbre knob just basically becomes sort of a pitch of the voice. It's time for that Daft Punk remake. Alright, so we're at the last synthesis mode, which is the modal synthesis mode, and I think this is another physical modeling one, and I'm just going to read out what they are from the manual. Um, the wave is going to be the inharm... Why is that so hard to say? So the wave is going to be the amount of inharmonicity or material selection. So let's just uh, turn this off and we'll just hear what that actually does. Uh, the shape actually does decay. We need some decay to hear it. So this is like we're hitting something and getting sounds depending on what it's made of. And the most cryptic one to me is the timbre, which is just called... Uh, oh, it actually is the timbre. And... Uh, the description for that is the excitation brightness and dust density. So I don't really know about the dust, but the manual write-up on this is actually pretty extensive. So if you're curious, take a look at it. Sort of a bell-like quality. It's real nice. One of the things I did in the intro was based on that synthesis mode. So I'm turning the release up, but really it's going to rely on the decay here. Maybe a little bit much. So that was more of a bell or uh, chime type sound, tubular chime. Let's see what else we can get. That's more of a gong-like sound. So this is a case where the pressure turns out to be pretty cool, where that if I want a long note, I can hit it flat. Or if I want a muted note, I can hit it perpendicular. Really kind of like it. All right, bonus points for an underwater sound. All right, my head is spinning from all those different synthesis modes, but feel like it's a good idea to go through it like that so everybody has an impression of what the starting sounds on the microfreak are. Now, there are others, like you can just get a nice pure tone out of the filter when you set the resonance high enough. And you can even use the LFO and the cycling envelope, which we didn't even touch on today. You can jack those up to higher frequencies, use those to control synthesis parameters, and effectively develop new forms of synthesis. And bear in mind that I kept things simple today and did one-to-one -one modulation. So one source, one destination. You can do many sources to a single destination or 
a single source to many destinations, any combination of that, and it can be quite complex. Now, in next week's video, I want to get into using the low frequency oscillator and the cycling envelope to control synthesizer parameters at slower rates. These are a really important part of the sound design potential of the microfreak. I'm particularly a fan of the cycling envelope, which you can use in conjunction with the main envelope, get more complex envelope shapes, or you can use them independently to control multiple parameters in very different ways. And you can also self-trigger it to turn it into a second LFO. So there's a lot to do with that. And then in two weeks, I hope to get into sequences and modulation sequences and hooking Microfreak up to other gear. So please make sure to subscribe if you already haven't. And as always, I appreciate you watching and I will see you in the next one.